Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You all hear an echo, or is that just me? Just me? Okay. All right. Okay. Father, I just thank you and praise you that you give me utterance in the Holy Spirit. All of you and none of me. Let your word come forth today. Let it penetrate the hearts of the hearers. Let it change their minds so that we can be less like ourselves and more like your son, Jesus. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the third in a series of lessons that I've been teaching on your thoughts and your words that the thing about that God wants us as far as to be children of God. Excuse me, guys, that uh, light. <laughs> um, thank you. I can see you all now. <laughs> Amen. Um, what God wants us to do in this transformation from becoming uh, I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ to a follower of Jesus Christ is that God wants us to change our minds about some things. And when we change our minds, what he's saying is that I want to change your heart. Your heart is the place of where you believe, where you trust, where you have confidence in. You know, Jesus said where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. In other words, the thing that you have the most confidence in, the thing that you put your trust in, where you put your beliefs in, that's where your heart is at. And what God wants to do in this transformation and in this new creation that's in Christ Jesus is that he's constantly want us to be changing our hearts as we grow and as we mature in the things of God. It's a constant state of changing your beliefs about how you look at things, how you think about things, how you respond to things. And we started out in Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verse 7 through 11. Again, I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. And it says, let the wicked, that word wicked comes from where we get our word wicker, which means twisted. And it says, let those who have twisted thinking, twisted thinking about God. It says, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. And we talked about this last week when we talked about moral law that moral law is the built-in conscience that God gave every human being at birth. And it doesn't matter whether you're atheist, it doesn't matter whether you're Buddhist, a Hindu, agnostic, Christian, it really doesn't matter. All of us was born with a conscience that told us right from wrong. And if you remember last week, we're doing a quick review. Moral laws are, which is built inside of every human being, is number one, we said that a parent is supposed to be responsible for their children and children are supposed to obey their parents. That's moral law. We said moral law included, we're not supposed to lie to people. We're not supposed to steal from people. We're not supposed to kill innocent people, amen? All of those are built in moral laws that you don't have to teach a child what a lie is. Child know he's lying when the first time they tell a lie. They know they're lying. Amen. At least this child did. Amen. So why? Because Romans 2, 14 and 15 says that uh, God's law is written on the hearts of all of our conscience. And so he says here, let them go back to the scripture, Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. You turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are not, this is God speaking, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Which lets us know that when we come to God, uh, there's going to have to be a renewing of the mind. Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, that this transformation that you're going to go through is going to be a changing of your mind. Amen? And then he says, um, verse 9, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In other words, whatever I thoughts I have, God wants to take me to another, a higher place. He wants to take me to a different place if we let him. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. 
They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. We know that we need rain for things to grow, for the plants to grow. And he says, giving that analogy of knowing how rain comes down and it waters the earth, he says, my word is the same way. My word is the same way when you allow my word to penetrate your heart. It's the same with my word. I send it out and it will always produce fruit. And we know that throughout the Bible, it talks about good fruit. A tree is Matthew 12. A tree is known by its fruit. John 15 says, uh, I'm the vine and you are the branch and you can't bear fruit unless you are connected to me. You get over to the Galatians chapter five and it talks about the fruits of the spirit being love, joy and peace and so on. That those are the fruits, those are the, that's the character of God that you and I should have, but we have to change our mind. And again, we said this last week also, that God has designed all of our minds, every human mind, to work the same way. And he, we said this last week, that our thoughts determine our emotions. Our emotions determine the way that we speak. We've said this a million times, I think I feel like. What am I describing? I'm describing what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling and the action that I wanna take as a result of the two. I think I feel like, I think I feel like. What we're saying that my thoughts have determined my feelings and my feelings or my emotions determine what I say it and what I'm saying is determine my actions. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life is in the power of the what? Tongue, your tongue is controlling your whole life. But what's controlling your tongue are your emotions and your thoughts. And he says, my actions did also, my thoughts determine my emotions, my emotions determine my speaking, my speaking determine my actions, my actions determine my habits. You keep thinking the same way, you keep feeling the same way, you keep speaking the same way, you keep acting the same way, and you are going to develop a habit. Amen? I don't care if it's from sucking your thumb to stealing. It really don't matter. If you keep thinking the same way, feeling the same way, uh, speaking the same way, doing the same thing, it will become habit. And one of the brilliant things about our minds is that once we learn a habit, we don't have to keep learning it. Most of you, if you drove here today, you did not, before you got in your car, you didn't have to have a lesson on driving. You've been driving uh, so long that some of you can drive, you shouldn't be doing this, but you can drive and hold your telephone up and talk on the phone. You know that's against the law in Indiana, amen. You can drive and text. I mean, you know that's against the law in Indiana. You can drive and text and uh, you can drive, fix your hair, put your, I've seen them put makeup on, all kinds of stuff while you're driving, why? Because I have developed the habit of driving, amen. And so he says here that my actions determine my habits, but my habits determine my responses to things, that I have, a, I have a habit of getting offended. I have a habit of being insulted. I have a habit of forgiving. I have a habit of laughing these things off or not letting these things bother me. Those are habits that you have developed based on the way that you were thinking. And then my responses determine my character that people know me by my fruit or people know me by my character, amen? You know, people, uh, hopefully when people uh, dis describe you, they will describe that, you know, that, that, that Julius, that's the way I want people to know me, that that Julius is positive, that Julius is always encouraging, that Julius is saying nice things, this Julius is pleasant to be around, that's what I want people to say about me because I want that to be the character that I have, not just in public, but also in private. How many of you know the people that know you are the people that are the closest to you? And the further people get away from you, the less they know about you because you get more relaxed around the people that you know, amen? And you'll take more chances with the people that you know. That's why it talks about hurting the people that you say you care about the most. Amen, I'm preaching real good this morning. <laughs> Jesus, uh, the last, oh, five or six weeks in Bible study, 
we've been going over the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus' famous, famous uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's in Matthew, it's in Luke, where it talks about, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he began to say, and he, and he started out with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, bless, bless, bless. Well, if you go through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's one central theme that Jesus is talking about, and he's talking about how we treat people. Amen? And what I want to do quickly today is go through this, this Matthew, Mark, or Matthew, this Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to talk about how Jesus is constantly talking to us about how we treat people. Because what I've discovered in just putting the Bible in its most simplest form, the Bible is all about how we treat each other. That's what God is more interested in than anything else that we do on this earth is how we treat each other. And you can learn the whole Bible. You can go through the Bible and say, I understand the Old Testament, and you can get on TV and teach on end time prophecy. Uh, you know, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, though you speak with the tongues of men and of angels, uh, you're just a useless nobody in one translation. You know everything. You go, uh, I get kind of jealous of some of my, my brothers who know a whole lot about the Old Testament. And uh, they can go in the Old Testament and they talk about this prophet and that story. And, and through my Christian walk, I have not really focused a whole lot on the Old Testament. I read the Old Testament over several times, but my focus has been on the New Testament. But a lot of my brothers, they're good at going back to that Old Testament, pulling stories out and pulling revelation out that I, I don't get. But it doesn't matter whether you know the Old Testament or the New Testament. If you don't know how to love, you still miss the whole point. Because I can tell you, you really don't need the Bible. Uh, this may sound radical because we're such Bible readers. You really don't need the Bible to become a Christian. Well, how can you prove that? Because in the early church, they didn't have a Bible. <laughs> the people that received Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost, when they received Jesus Christ, they didn't receive Jesus Christ because they had uh, read the book of Romans where it says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with all thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Paul hadn't even been saved. Romans hadn't been written. So how did they receive Jesus Christ? Because they saw the fruit of Jesus Christ in the lives of those that had, that had professed to be Christians or the followers of Jesus Christ. It wasn't like they had a Bible. The Bible had, the New Testament had not been written on the day of Pentecost. The New Testament hadn't been written when uh, Peter goes to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10 and his whole house was saved. I maintain that when you receive Jesus Christ, he puts the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit is the lead and guide us into what? All truth. We sit back and say, no, the Bible is the only way. No, the Holy Spirit is the way. Because again, before the Bible, especially the New Testament, before the Bible was written, all they had was the words of Jesus Christ. And people followed him. And people are just as saved back then as they are today. So we're going to look at this, this famous Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to pick out some highlights because again, if you never learn how to get along with people, you really haven't learned about this Bible. And in fact, your whole proof that you are truly a Christian is based on how you treat people. We know that from, I think it's 1 John 3.14 that says that you, or 3.19 somewhere in there, that says that you know that you've passed from death to life by how you treat people. You know that you're truly a Christian by how you treat people. John 13, 34 said, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another the way that I have loved you, that all men may know, that all people may know that you are my disciples by what? By the way you treat each other. So don't tell me how deep you are spiritually and then you can't get along with the people at your house. I've had some, well, I've had some deep Christians who, They've studied this, and this kind of gets me too. 
you get around these deep Christians and they say, uh, uh, what's your doctrine? I, I, I want to know if you teach the right doctrine, right teaching, you know, and they want to e examine you. We want to figure out whether or not you doing it right. Well, look here, knucklehead, how you treat people at house, at the house. So that's what I want to check out. While you checking out my doctrine, I want to know how you treat your wife, how you treat, how you treat your husband. Because you may know the right doctrine, but if you don't know how to treat your wife and you don't know how to treat your husband and you don't know how to, you, you'll turn your back on your children. I don't care what doctrine, you haven't learned anything out of this book. Say amen to that. So when they ask me about my doctrine, I say, how you get along? Especially some of these folks on, on Facebook, they like to attack, you know. Uh, one guy said, uh, why are you teaching all that false doctrine? I said, how are you getting along with your woman? Well, I don't want to talk about that. I said, yeah, I want to talk about it. Because <laughs> that's the proof that you know something about this book. By how well you get along with people. In fact, you can always tell when your heart has been turned away from God by how you treat people. At least that's what the marriage counselor told me. I told him I have a big problem with, with my wife. He said, you don't have a problem with your wife? I said, what do you mean I don't have a problem with my wife? He said, you have a problem with your relationship with God. <laughs> yeah, made me feel this big. Because I was going to tell him my doctrine. <laughs> He's like, man, I don't care about what you know about the Bible. In fact, I remember years ago, um, I picked up a guy named Craig Hayes. He was the assistant pastor for Frederick Price out in California. I picked him up in Indianapolis at the airport to take him back to uh, Fort Wayne, where, I was, where I'm from and where I was living at the time. And he was going to speak to our men's group. And he just spent two hours just talking to me. I'm this, shoot, I must have been 30 years old. And, um, and I'm talking to Craig Hayes all the way back to Indianapolis. And uh, he said, I don't understand you young guys. In fact, he just recently passed away. And uh, he said, I don't understand you young guys. Y'all sitting around talking about, I heard this one guy, he was talking about his, his woman is this, she's that, talking about all the bad things about his wife, and, and she don't do this, and she don't do that, and she don't do that. He said, I had to stop the guy and ask him, are you just talking about one woman? Because <laughs> you sound like you're describing three or four women. You just, you mean to tell me you a child of God and you can't get along with one person? And I said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Because I, I, I think my wife sometimes is six people. <laughs> Amen. No, you should be able to get along with somebody. And you know that you're, whenever you turn your heart from God, you begin to question God's word. You begin to doubt God's word. And it will tell off on how you treat people. Amen. So. Jesus said this over in Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to give a summary of that, of the Sermon on the Mount and how Jesus was teaching us how to get along with each other. Because again, I maintain to you from Genesis to Revelation, if you want to get one central thing throughout this Bible, it's about how we get along with people. But over there, Jesus teaches us not to be controlled by anger. He called uncontrolled anger murder. And again, he was teaching them that I know what Moses told you, but I want you to listen to what I told you. Because what Moses told you, he was trying to get you to me. That's what Paul explains in Galatians, that, that Moses and whatever he taught in the Ten Commandments and whatever t Moses taught in the Mosaic Law, he did not teach you the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I'm here to explain to you things Moses did not even understand. And he told you all, thou shalt not kill, but I'm telling you, don't even get angry at somebody. Right, because when you get angry, you open the door up to murder. That's what causes murder, talking about killing innocent people. And man, if we can get that out on the streets of Indianapolis, all these angry, mad people, and they're wondering, how did I end up stabbing? How, you know, I... <laughs> My apartment complex, and I'm supposed to be living in one of upscale apartment complex. Shoot, a couple of weeks ago, somebody got stabbed to death right down the street from me. I'm like, this ain't, it happens everywhere you find angry people. <laughs> Amen. And then he says over here in Matthew 5, 27 through 32, Jesus teaches about marriage. That's where uh, he said, Moses taught you all, thou shalt not commit adultery. He said, but adultery starts when you lust after a woman in your heart. Or a man in your heart. When you get thoughts about it, 
that's what causes it. So I know Moses talked to you about the physical act. I'm going to take you to your mind and realize the problem is where you think. It's not what you do, because if you change what you think, you wouldn't be doing those things. Amen? Then over in Matthew 5, 43 through, 40, uh, 43 through 48, teaches, Jesus teaches on how to treat our enemies. People, you know, the word now is haters. How do I treat people that don't like me? Well, in, in Matthew 5, 44, he said, love your enemies. But again, you got to think like this. you got to bless those that curse you. you got to do good to those that hate you. You got to pray for those that despitefully use you. And in verse 45, Matthew 5, 45, then people will know that you're one of my followers. That's the only way is that you got to think differently about people that come against you because he said, Moses taught you an eye for an eye. What's an eye for an eye? When you do something to me, I'm going to do something of equal value or worse to you. He said, that's what Moses taught you, but I'm teaching you something. If you're going to operate in the kingdom of God, if you're going to do things that I, the way that I do them, you don't treat your enemies like they treat you. You love them. That's how you respond to them. You bless those that curse you. You do good to those that hate you. You pray for those that despitefully use you. Amen? So next time somebody, uh, and it won't probably maybe even be by the end of the day today, Somebody do something you don't like. Remember, Pastor Judy said, love them. Bless them. Do something good for them. And before you cuss them out, pray for them. Amen? It's hard to cuss and pray at the same time. <laughs> Amen? Again, he's saying, I want to teach you what it's really like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to get you away from, I'm a, I'm a Methodist, I'm an apostolic, I, I, I'm Lutheran, I'm Baptist, I'm Adventist, I'm this, I'm that. No, the follower of Jesus Christ can only know, you can only know them by their fruits, by their character, and their character can only be shown by how we treat each other. Amen? Matthew 6, 1 through 4, Jesus teaches about giving to those who are less fortunate than we are. He says, you see somebody in need and you shut up your bowels of compassion? No. Jesus said, I, 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 I was sick and you didn't visit, didn't visit me. I was in jail. You didn't visit me. I was hungry and you didn't uh, feed me. I was naked and you didn't close me. And they said, Jesus, when, you do, when, did, didn't, when did anybody ever treat you like that? He said, when you do it done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. As Christians, we're supposed to be some of the most giving people on the planet. Some of the most giving, man, we should live to give. Amen? Why? Because God said, I, in Matthew, in, even in this same sermon, Matthew 6, 25 uh, through 33, Jesus was saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. In other words, take the focus off of you. I take care of all of that. But seek ye first my way of doing things. He says, I'm a God of abundance. I will give you more than enough. Why do I need to have more than enough so that I can be a blessing to someone else? Man, I love living the giving life. And nothing better than that. I mean, just the other day, uh, we haven't lived in this apartment long, and, you know, people are constantly moving in and moving out. And, and this couple uh, that we just been living next to for three months, they were living there while they were building their house, and finally their house was built, and they moved out Friday. Carol was like, man, we got to get them a gift. They didn't ask for no gift from us. But it's just the way we think. Man, we got to, we, let's bless them. Let's bless them on their new house, because we're looking for a house too, amen? We want to sow some good seeds. Amen. Just think, constantly thinking, how can I be a blessing? Because way back in Abraham, when God called Abraham, he said, I want to bless you to be a what? To be a blessing. And he said, and so shall your seed see. So shall your seed be. The seed of Abraham are not Jews. The seed of Abraham are the followers of Jesus Christ, according to Galatians. Everybody think, no, the seed of Abraham is Jew. No, it's not the Jews. It's the, it's the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ and all those who are following Jesus Christ. We are the seed of Abraham, and we come from every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. And what he puts on the inside of us is a heart to give. Amen? Another thing that he taught in just 
Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Again, this is all about how to treat people. In Matthew 7, 1 through 6, Jesus teaches us not to judge. Judge simply means I'm going to determine your value. It doesn't mean that I can't point out what's right or wrong in your life, but when I lower your value based on your behavior, I am wrong. When I decide you're not a good human being and, and, and I'm better than you based on your behavior, he said, you're wrong to judge people that way. And he goes on in this same lesson. He, he said, well, why, uh, in one translation says, why are, are you looking at the toothpick in your brother's eye while you ignore the telephone pole in your eye? <laughs> well, what is he talking about? You're so focused in on what they're doing wrong, you realize that you don't even realize that you judging them is worse than what they did wrong because you're going to treat them based on the way that you judge them. And if you don't think that they are no value in your eyes, it's easy to hurt people that you don't value. That's why all these people can kill people. You first lower their value to a value of zero, then I can kill that, then I can kill you and I can take your life. And it's the same thing. You can lower the value of your wife to zero. You can lower the value of your husband to zero. You can lower the value of your children to zero. And as soon as you lower their value, that's when you give yourself permission to mistreat them. I'm preaching real good this morning. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why? Because this is all about how we treat people. Over in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus teaches that many will claim to know me, but only those who follow his law. But what's his law? He's only given us one, John 13, that you love one another the way that I love you. It's called the royal law. It's Roman 13, 8 that says, oh, no man, nothing but to love him. Love is the curtain rod. Can I get you to see this illustration? You know, a curtain rod is there to hold up what? The curtain, that ain't a trick question. The curtain rod is there to hold up the curtain, amen? And see, the curtain rod of love is what's hold everything up when it comes to God. Faith is on that curtain rod. Confidence is on that curtain rod. Trust is on that curtain rod, amen? On that curtain rod of love are all the fruits of the Spirit. Salvation is on that curtain rod. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, Everything that holding up, everything that pertains to God is held up by this curtain rod of love. Well, if this curtain rod of love fall down, guess what? Everything on the curtain fall down with it. Amen? And soon as you decide that you're going to mistreat people, that you're not going to treat people right, then everything that you're talking about, you represent God, it all falls down with it. I remember we was in school, I, I mean, in church years ago. I didn't understand this song, but I, I understand it now. When I was a little boy in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, they used to open up those hymnals and they said, Love lifted me. How many of y'all remember that? Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Love lifted me. Why? Because it was love that fell down that caused me to fall into this anger and bitterness and lonely and depression and blaming everybody else for my problem. But he said, when love, good God Almighty, love lifted me. Amen. God's love lifted me. And I began to see things differently. I began to understand things differently. I began to treat people differently when I let love lifted me. Amen. And so he says here, uh, in Matthew 7, many will claim in that day, Lord, I prophesied. I was on TV, and, and I was selling, pro and I, I, I mean, I was giving. I was just, how many of you know they sell prophecies on TV? Don't buy one. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> they'll, sell, they'll sell you a prophecy. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But what I'm saying is that, yeah, I prophesied in your name. I, you even can do good things for the wrong motives. Amen. God is not impressing. He's not impressed when you're feeding the hungry, but you're mistreating people once you get back home. Because again, man is always looking on the uh, uh, Samuel, uh, or 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man is always looking on the outward appearance, but what God is looking at is your motives. You know, Lieutenant and I, we had a, uh, uh, we were talking this week, and he kept bringing up the word commitment, commitment. A a everything is about your commitment to God. How committed are you, God? Your test, whenever the devil come against you, where does he test it? He's testing your commitment to God. 
will you do right or will you not? Amen. And it won't be because you don't know if whether or not you choose to. And so he says, many are going to say of all the stuff that they did, they wrote books in his name. They preached great sermons in his name. But God says, I want to see how you treat people when you got back home. I want to know how, how did you treat people when no one else was looking? Last one, as we go through this, uh, well, that's the last one of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, last couple of points, and then we'll get you out of here. Y'all doing all right? God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. And he says that anyone who does not know, does not love, does not know God. God's number one concern on earth is how we treat each other. That one of the things that I'm enjoying right now is seeing churches who want to talk about racism. Because what is racism? It's all about how we treat each other. I, I, I'm seeing white pastors and black pastors. In fact, um, a, a brother called me the other day uh, from the Church of the Brethren uh, up in northern Indiana. And a guy I've been known for years. And he, he says, since all of this racial unrest has broke out in the United States, and these are all whites, he says, we want to talk about, we've been talking about race and how we have looked at black people and, and how black people, the relationship that we have, and we are the church. And if there's anybody that should know how to treat people, it should be the church. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, well, I know a black guy. <laughs> I have him talk to us. And he called me up and he, he, he said, Julius, would you be willing to talk to, to we, we have questions. Would you be willing to talk? And I said, well, you know, I'm not representing all 30 million of them, but I, I you know, black folk, y'all get mad if y'all, he ain't representing me. I don't think, okay, I'll just be representing me. And my, and my point of view, but sure. And I think it's July 30th. Uh, we're supposed to have a conference call or a Zoom call. And uh, we, we're just going to talk about it. Because one of the things in, in getting along with people, when they tell you how you're mistreating them, believe them. Man, there is no greater honor you can give somebody than to believe them. There's no greater honor you can give God than to believe him. That is the greatest honor you can give God, is to believe what he says. And it's the same thing. If you got your foot on my foot and I say, ow, it hurt, and you say it don't hurt that bad, you don't believe me. Or your foot on my neck, or whatever it is, you don't believe me. And if you don't believe me, you give yourself permission for things to remain the same. Amen? But if I'm yelling and screaming that my foot hurt, my neck hurt, that this hurts, and you sitting around talking about, well, it, does, it didn't hurt me. I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about it hurt me. And we must be willing to get along with people that if they tell us that I'm doing things that they hurt, that are hurting them, that I should give them enough honor and respect to believe them and then figure out how can I stop your pain. Say amen to that. Amen. We got to want to stop hurting people and stop pretending. Don't tell me. Don't tell me you choking me and got, your, got yourself. You choking the life out of me. And I'm saying I can't breathe. And you talking about I can. I know you can't. I'm talking about me. Amen. Calm me down this morning. But again, if we're going to get along with people, we got to be willing. First of all, the highest honor you can give somebody is to believe them. And once you believe them, the door is open for you to listen. And then whatever corrections need to be made, now we can make the correction because I respect you enough to believe you. God's number one concern on earth is how we treat each other. Our number one concern on earth should be how we treat each other. If that's God's number one concern, then that should be our number one concern. Yes, the ultimate is being saved and giving your life to Jesus Christ. I, I don't want to dismiss that. That is number one. But after that, we give our life to Jesus Christ. His number one concern is how are you going to treat people as you follow me? Amen? And the only way that we can evaluate our relationship with God is how we treat others. Um, 
God teaches, and I'm going to close out here. Give me about two minutes. God, throughout the whole Testament, the whole Bible, has basically taught four fundamental lessons that everything else is built upon. Salvation, uh, deliverance, prosperity, uh, uh, the fruit, like I say, the fruits of the Spirit, end time harvest, prophecy. All of these are built on these four simple truths. In the Old Testament, it was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another the way that I love you. And we're going to go back and develop these next week, I believe. I've been trying to get to them for two weeks now. The third one is Paul's teaching. And Paul taught this. Um, I can't quote it. Let me write that. I wrote this down. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the whole New Testament, who was teaching the gospel of grace, Moses taught the law from Genesis to Malachi. Jesus taught the kingdom of God in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Paul picks up and he's teaching the gospel of grace, that everything that God has done from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation is a result of his grace, his unmerited favor toward us. But he says, Paul says this in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, the purpose of my instructions would be filled, is that would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart and a clear conscience and genuine faith. He said, if you want to know why I'm teaching what I'm teaching, my motivation for teaching what I'm teaching which is two-thirds of the whole reason why I'm talking to the Romans and the church at Corinth and the church at Colossae and the church at Ephesus and the church at Philippi and Thessalonica and Titus and Timothy. And the reason why I'm writing these things is that so that you can love from a pure heart, that you can have a good conscience and genuine faith. If you want to understand what I'm writing when I write this New Testament, and then the thing that's going to last throughout eternity. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. He says, now abide in faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. He said, we're going to take them. Yeah, we, we're going to, you can take these to heaven with you. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is going to be love. And how do we know we love? By how we treat people. You get blessed today. Amen, amen, amen. And amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I found marriage was about. Marriage is all about growing. It's about growing and how we get along with each other. How we get, you either grow together or you grow apart. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? God wants to teach us how to grow together. And uh, you get stronger all the time. Paul said, though my outward man is perishing, my inward man is getting what? Stronger. Second Corinthians chapter four. He said, my inward man is getting stronger every day. Man, my love walk, our love walk should be getting stronger every day, even though people are still doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing. I know me and my wife, the stuff we used to argue about, we laugh about now. Oh, it's a lot easier laughing about it than fussing about it. Amen. I tell Carol all the time, you hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings. But you know what? My feelings ain't hurt. I just... Telling her to be quiet. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, it ain't like I, I, I'm so hurt that we're going to sit down and fuss and fight all night about it. No, it, it, no, uh-uh. Why? Because God gave me in charge of my feelings, not her. Amen? I'm through. All right. You may be here today or maybe you're watching us online and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, until you're born again, you cannot see how God does things. You'll never even understand how to do what I'm talking about. Even though you've been, been instructed on how to do it, you don't have the power of God on the inside of you to do it. John 1, 12 says, to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God. And to receive that power, it starts by receiving Jesus. And if you've never received him, uh, it's simple. He says, if you, again, change the way you think. Amen. He said, if you, if, you seek to, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with all your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. It's a simple confession of faith that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart 
you trust this. You have confidence in this. This is where to believe. He said, then you will be saved. So we make this confession every week to receive Jesus Christ. And if you've never made this confession, make this confession with me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, you said in your word that if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with all my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I would be saved. Father, right now, I'm confessing before heaven, hell, and all these people that Jesus is Lord of my life. If you said that for the first time, slip your hands. I know uh, in, with our congregation this morning, I said most of us are saved. Uh, but if you're online and you've made that confession of faith, uh, send us a, 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 who you are in the chat room or go to wordoffaithindy.org. Uh, leave a message. We'd like to get a hold of you to give you some further instruction. But this walk is all about getting along with people. Amen. There's nothing more enjoyable on this earth than seeing people you like and they like you. Amen. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Well, if you need prayer before you go, uh, brothers up here.